thank you all for joining me um, for the Allergies Masterclass. Now, everybody is muted automatically, but I really love it when people just ask questions in the chat box as we go along, because I tend to bore myself with my own voice. And it's obviously much better if this um, next hour of your life is going to be more relevant to you. So, you know, ask the questions that you know, you have for you, your kids, your family, just pop them into the chat box. And if it's something I'm going to cover later, I'll just say, yeah, I'll hang on to that one for now. But if it's relevant to what we're talking about, I'm not going to cover it. We'll cover it then. So I'm Lisa and I'm the founder of the Pediatric Naturopath. So um, this, this is our team. At the pediatric naturopath so for many many years it was just myself but now we have all these lovely people on the team so some of you may have worked with some of the other um, practitioners on the team so there's summer sarah me kelly kate and amy so um summer and sarah are nutritionists and feeding therapists and then the rest of us are nutritionists and naturopaths and we see people both face to face in Boai, at least myself and Kate do, and everybody else is via telehealth all over Australia and all over the world, in fact. And we all have kids. So, you know, I think it's very hard to be able to give good, relevant advice to families if you don't actually have children and you know what it's actually like on the cold front, so to speak. Um, so I don't know how many kids we have between us, but it's quite a lot. So tonight's all about food allergies. And as I started to put this together and then, you know, asking questions um, on Instagram about what people wanted to know, it just, the topic just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I appreciate that we all only have limited time and limited concentration spans. So um, this, you know, this will not cover everything that you need to know about allergy, but hopefully I've hit the high points that you want to know. So we're going to talk about what is a food allergy and what the different types are. And that in itself gets actually quite complicated. We're going to talk about food ladders, the symptoms of allergies, how we test for them, dust mite allergies, because I know a lot of people had questions about that. And then what our process is for allergies. And I'll share some you know, functional tests that we do for allergies as well. So this is a very busy slide, but this comes directly from the Royal Children's Hospital. So this is, you know, this is where it's at with immunology. So if a child has an adverse food reaction that's reproducible, as in they don't just have it once and they never have it again, like they can have it over and over and over again. It can be one of two kind of broad categories of things. So it can be a food allergy, which is driven by the immune system or it can be a food intolerance, which is not driven by the immune system. And under food intolerances, they've written here things like lactose intolerance, so yes, but there's also IgG reactions, which, you know, they still involve the immune system, but they're generally regarded as a food intolerance. Things like food chemical sensitivities, so lots of people are sensitive to amines or salicylates, different naturally occurring compounds. They all go on this side of the chart. And then over on this side, we've got the food reactions that involve your immune system. And the most well-known are the IgE mediated ones. So that's where you eat a food, you get a reaction. And it says less than 60 minutes, but it can be instantaneous. It can be within a minute. And that's where kids eat something and they get hives or they get a rash or they go into anaphylaxis straight away. So this is where I was at with two of my kids. So two of my two, I've got three kids. Two of them had IgE mediated reactions. One was to egg and dairy and the other child had IgE mediated food reactions to 12 different foods. And so the one that only had two reactions, she actually went into anaphylaxis when she was at daycare one time because they accidentally fed her some egg and that was instantaneous like they didn't even sort of acknowledge that she'd eaten anything it was so quick and she just passed on then you've got the non-IgE mediated ones so these are ones that 
or sorry, the mix. So it's a, a mixture, a bit of IgA, but then a bit of non-IgA. And that can be eczema, so atopic dermatitis, and something called eosinophilic esophagitis, which we can call AOE for short, but that's where you get a thickening of your esophagus and it's a food reaction. It won't show up on a skin prick test, but it is a hundred percent a food reaction. And whenever I put children with this condition on an elimination diet to eliminate the main allergens, they get better. And then you've got ones that are not IgE mediated. So you've got f pice which is the first one, food protein-induced allergic proctolitis, and then food protein-induced enteropathy, enterocolitis, and celiac disease. Let's check my chat box. No chats. Um, so what is it? It's, a, it's an immune system reaction of food allergy that happens straight after having the food. It can get symptoms such as hives, swollen airways, and then the anaphylaxis. I think it's really important to realize as well that anaphylaxis in a young child does not necessarily look like anything. So they don't get the big lips or, you know, the swollen eyes or anything. They can just, their blood pressure drops, they pass out. And that's what happened to my daughter because she was um, like 21 months at the time. She just passed out. There was no swelling. There was no nothing that looked like she had a food reaction. And the other important thing to note is that you can have a food allergy and you get hives and then the next time you get hives and the next time you get hives. And then on the fourth time you can get anaphylaxis. So you don't get anaphylaxis generally the first time you have a reaction, but you can get it. So that's why you need to get this evaluated and make sure you have an EpiPen if that's deemed necessary because um, anaphylaxis can happen eventually especially with bee stings. I mean, we're not talking about bee stings today, but that's one situation where um, you can get bitten by a bee like 10 times and then on the 11th time you have anaphylaxis. So the IgG reactions sort of sit over on the right-hand side of that table. And those are the ones that are a slow burn. So you don't feed the child the food and they have a reaction. You feed the child the food and six hours later, they have a reaction or 12 hours later, 24 hours later, they have a reaction. And it can be rashes and hives, but it can also be a migraine, asthma, eczema, tummy pain, constipation, chronic fatigue. So, you know, this is where, you know, people will go to the doctor and the doctor will organize IgE testing. It'll come back negative and they'll say you're fine just eat everything and testing for this is quite hotly disputed even amongst naturopaths a lot of people don't believe in testing for igg reactions but the problem is is that they're very hard to identify because you can have an igg reaction to like you know really common foods like dairy wheat eggs and if you're eating those foods multiple times a day you're never seeing a no reaction state. Your child will always have asthma because they're having dairy three times a day, or they'll always have constipation because they're having eggs three times a day. So it's much more tricky to identify. So you can do a blood test, which is what I do sometimes, but the best way to do it is to cut out the main allergens for a few weeks, get rid of the symptoms. So get rid of the eczema, the constipation, the migraines, and then systematically, introduce those foods back one at a time. So obviously this is a painful thing to do because um, not only do you have to cut it all out, but you have to bring it back one at a time. So it takes a few months to really get a grip on it, but it can be very enlightening when you do that. Um, and I firmly believe that, you know, children don't have to live with these issues. And I would much rather a child never gets to eat dairy than has to live with some of these issues. Um, so this is pretty scary. Almost 20% of the Australian population have an allergic disease. And 20, 50, how many years is that? 25 years, it's estimated it will be up to 70%. And Australian kids have the highest prevalence of food allergy in the world. 
Yay. Um, so 40 to 50% of children in this study had some sort of symptoms of allergy in their first four years. So that's, you know, either the IgE, the non-IgE, the mixed, all of those things. But for the IgE food allergies, so the ones that are, you know, potentially life-threatening, where you get an immediate reaction and it's emergency, 11% of kids will have one of these reactions at the age of one. And then by the age of four, it's down to 4%. So it goes from one in 10 down to about one in 20. And the reason why it drops is because a lot of kids will grow out of their egg allergies and their dairy allergies. Nut allergies, what, like when you look at the research, it will say that nut allergies, once you have them, you have them for life, that's it. So that's tree nuts and peanuts. But as I'll show you later, that's not necessarily true because my son was allergic to all the nuts plus peanuts plus multiple other foods. And now he's just got food allergies. So if you do take some of the steps that we recommend, you can outgrow the allergies. My daughter outgrew her egg allergy. Well, she outgrew her dairy allergy at 15 months because I was very happy because I didn't have to keep breastfeeding any longer. And she outgrew her egg allergy at about six, I think. So she had no egg up until that. I don't know why my clicker keeps going the wrong way. So these are the top allergens in Australia. So you got your eggs, your milk, peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, soy, fish, shellfish, and wheat. And if you're allergic to milk, you can also be allergic to soy. They're very similar proteins. So if you cut out dairy and replace it with soy milk, you say, ah, oh, cut out dairy, didn't help. They still have the same problems. If you replace it with soy milk, that's why. And similarly, if your child actually has a reaction to nuts and you cut out milk and you replace it with almond milk and they don't get any better, same thing. They could just be reacting to a different food. Fish and shellfish are funny ones because you could be 40 and you've eaten fish your whole life and then you develop an allergy. So that sucks. So the big question is why are allergies increasing? And there's, a, there's many reasons. This is four of them. There are a few more, but this is kind of the main four. And the first one is there's the hygiene hypothesis, which has been talked about for a long time now. And basically we're cutting out like parasites and worms, which are challenging your immune system. We're cutting out a lot of the dirt out of our life. Like we all used to live on farms. We used to share the shed with maybe a few goats. We're not doing that anymore. We used to wash our dishes by hand, which is not really that thorough. Now we all have dishwashers. There's many, many reasons. And God forbid I had to give up my dishwasher to stop allergies because that would not be good. But we're sterilizing everything because we've got a dishwasher. And I remember reading a study years ago, and it was basically having a dishwasher significantly increased your chances of your child developing food allergy and having a pet significantly decreased it. So there you go. Pets are, you know, dirtier. Um, then the next one is the delayed introduction of allergenic foods. And this one has flip-flopped. You know, even in my lifetime, I've seen the advice for this change multiple times. 25, 30 years ago, when you were pregnant, it was like, don't eat peanuts. Don't eat things that your child could develop an allergy to. And that clearly didn't work because, you know, things have skyrocketed from then. And now they've changed their minds, like eat the foods when you're allergic. And so I mentioned that my daughter was allergic to eggs. I did eat eggs when I was pregnant. I ate a lot of them. And the foods that my son's allergic to, I ate them when I was pregnant as well. So who knows? And... Also, my daughter showed that she was allergic to eggs when she was about six months when I gave her mayonnaise, which is very stupid, but on a piece of bread, very stupid. Um, so they weren't delayed in their introduction, but they still had allergies. So these are all kind of theories, but if you look at your own personal family situation, they may not apply. Low vitamin D. So in the last, again, 30-ish years, they slip, slop, slap, um, your message has been very strong in Australia and consequently everybody's deficient in vitamin D now and you need vitamin D to modulate your immune system so to both to dampen down overreactions and then to boost up your immune system to stop you getting sick all the time so if we're all walking around in a very vitamin D deficient state we're more likely to get sick 
but were more likely to develop allergies. And that's really, really clear in the research. So if you go back to what I said earlier, that Australia has one of the highest rates of allergies in the world, the Slip Stop Sap campaign has dropped everybody's vitamin D. So that ties in nicely with that. Um, and the other thing that ties in to that is the high rate of um, people living in Australia that were not born in Australia, such as myself, um, well, my kids. So I was born in Ireland, my kids were born here. First generation immigrants have a higher rate of allergies than people who have lived here all the time. And that's especially true for families who have moved from Asia to here, their children will be very, very at risk of developing food allergies. Again, many reasons. I personally think that my microbiome is Irish and then it got transplanted here. And then that's just the changes that I passed on to my kids are kind of born with the wrong microbiome because mine was from Ireland. That's kind of my theory. And then development of the allergy, development um, exposure to the allergy through the skin before through the gut. And I put a picture of celery because in one of the European countries, I think it's the Netherlands, there used to be a mastitis cream that contained celery. And in that country, lots of kids have a celery allergy. So if you're in Europe and you're looking at food, I might say may contain traces of nuts, um, egg and celery because kids have celery allergies. And in Australia, obviously I've never heard of anyone having a celery allergy, but that's because moms were putting this mastitis cream on their breasts, breastfeeding their children. So the children were getting that um, mastitis cream through their skin, like through their little cheeks. And something which I'll cover more in a minute as well as the link between having eczema and having broken skin and developing food allergy. I'll just cover what a food ladder is, because if you have a child with an allergy, you may have heard this term being bandied about, but it's a structured way to introduce foods. So the more cooked a protein, the less allergenic it is. So if your child has an egg allergy and you do skin prick testing and you can see the allergy is decreasing over time, you might be told to introduce the egg ladder, which will start off with um, a muffin. So you have 12 muffins, which have been cooked at 180 degrees for like 25 minutes. And there's only one egg divided through all those muffins. So very slow, very low quantity of eggs cooked very, very well. That's the least allergenic form of eggs. And if your child's okay with that, then, you know, you might be told to eat two muffins a week for the next year. And then, well, a year, maybe not a year, but for a while, and then you progress to the next stage. And ultimately you get to mayonnaise, which is raw eggs. And so I remember I went to the hospital with my daughter for a food challenge one time and we started with the muffins. So I thought, let's go with the least allergenic food. And we gave her a muffin, gave her a bite of a muffin and her face went nuts. So she failed. So we went back a year later and we had a muffin again. And this time she was fine. But whatever the next stage, I think the next stage was scrambled eggs. Like it took her another year to be able to get to scrambled eggs. And it took her many, many years before she could have mayonnaise without a reaction. Never start a food ladder without professional help. Because if you misjudge what they can tolerate, then you can trigger anaphylaxis. And um, when my daughter had anaphylaxis, it was to a bite of a burger. So the burgers wouldn't have been cooked for half an hour at 180, but they were well cooked and there was one egg in one kilo of mince and she had one bite. So like minuscule amount and she went into anaphylaxis. So never just think, oh, I'm going to start the food ladder. Make sure you get some sort of, um, you know, input. Now I'm just going to pause and see, does anybody have any questions? I'll just give you a second to type them in while I just say, so there's also a soy ladder and a dairy ladder and they have things like biscuits and i'm not as familiar with them but if you google you know if you're on that path with soy and dairy and you google you'll get different food ladders from different countries with the different foods and also i mean i've seen people who have been put on a food ladder by an immunologist and it's obviously been misjudged 
because they've come to me and their child's still having tummy pain, not sleeping, has eczema, and they're having like, you know, one or two muffins a week. And then when we cut out the muffins, all those issues go away. So I think immunologists can sort of be a bit premature in putting you on a ladder. So no questions so far. So I'll keep going. So these are all the symptoms you can get in babies. And I mean, like babies, every baby is different. Even if you've had five babies, you haven't had five babies the same. So they all have different temperaments and, um, you know, different everything. But these issues, if they are a big issue for your child, then maybe it is a food reaction. So unsettled behavior, gut discomfort. So, you know, when they're sort of straining and wriggling, being very fussy, just crying and crying and crying, back arching, you know, can be anything. But then when you get down to things like mucus in stools, blood in the stools, um, lots of vomiting, all these things. Um, I'm so much older and wiser now than when I had my first child, because my first child was 16 and she vomited a lot. And then my next child vomited an awful lot like everything I had to change my clothes multiple times so she just vomited and vomited and she was she had other medical issues so I just kind of assumed it was that and it was only when we did the allergy testing when she was six months old that it was like actually she's got an IgE reaction to dairy and there am I chugging my lattes every day so she was vomiting because I was drinking milk and even when that was diagnosed no the immunologist still didn't say oh and by the way as well as not giving her dairy, you also need to not drink dairy. So she just continued to vomit until I worked that up. <laughs> so if your child is vomiting up all the food all the time, considering what you're drinking. Um, and eczema, absolutely. Oh, wrong way again. Oh, God. And then in older children, it's a bit different. So they might have started off with eczema and then it turns into asthma. I'm going to talk about all of this in more detail in the next slide. Enlarged tonsils, enlarged adenoids, and frequent ear infections. So this scary little diagram is the atopic march. And this is, um, everything I say is not a hunch. My personal stories about my family are obviously not in the research, but everything else that I say is based on what is in the research. It's not just a hunch. So this is what happens. You start off, a child starts off zero and they develop eczema. And you can see the allergy line comes after the eczema line. So I always thought that kids developed eczema because they had food allergies, but actually it's potentially the other way around. They develop food allergies because they've got the eczema. So that impaired skin barrier means that they're getting exposed to foods before they get the food into their gut. So that kind of blew my mind when I heard that. So they start off with the eczema, and then you can see at the age of about seven, that's really dropped down to quite a low level. Obviously still adults and older children have eczema, but it drops significantly. So when child's one, they've got bad eczema, the mum realizes that if they cut out dairy, the eczema goes away. Then when the child is five, they stop having eczema, the mother starts giving them dairy again. And lo and behold, look at this, they develop asthma. And nobody really correlates the fact that they had a food allergy and eczema when they were young, and now they have asthma. It's the same thing, it's just different stages. So if your child is seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and has asthma, it's probably the same things that were triggering their eczema when they were younger and they probably still need to be off eggs or milk or whatever it was. And you can see allergic rhinitis, which can be to pollen, can be to dust mites. It starts off young, so very rare for like a one-year-old or two-year-old to have a dust mite allergy. But by the time they're, you know, 10 teenage years, a lot of them have dust mite allergies and allergic rhinitis, and it's the same thing. It's just part of the atopic march. And there's things that you can do to stop that.
I don't know what my mouse is doing. I'm so sorry. There we go. So this is just another representation of the same thing. So in infancy, you've got the eczema, you've got the food allergy. And then in childhood, you got the asthma and the um, allergic rhinitis. And this is the atopic march. But why I've put this particular diagram in is because it shows all the different things that can impact this. So you got your skin barrier, and that's a lot to do with this thing, filagrin, um, which is very much to do with eczema. You've got your microbiome alteration. You've got genetic things, social dysfunction of cells, and epigenetic factors. So out of this, what can we control? And I don't even know what social dysfunction of cells means, so I'm pretty sure I can't control that. But what I can control is the microbiome, and I can alter your child's or my child's microbiome. That's something that we have in our um, toolbox. And this is another very busy chart about the same thing, but um, again, the environmental factors that we can modify are the allergen penetration, so, you know, getting it in your skin and the microbiome, but then also, you know, progression, persistence and exacerbation of these environmental modifiers. So if you know your child has a dust mite allergy or a cat allergy or a dog allergy, keep them away from that. Keep their room as dust free as possible. Get rid of the cat um, because that's going to stop or slow down this progression to asthma and allergic rhinitis. You can't just expose a little bit to the cat and the dog and the dust mite and hope that they grow out of it. You're not helping if you do that. And I'd be happy to get rid of my cat. If anyone was allergic to my dog, I'd have to make some hard choices, but if it was the cat, that would be okay. So again, I'm just gonna pause there for questions. Anyone wants to ask anyone else if they want to take their cat? <laughs> no. Just type in any questions, or if you don't want to type, you can unmute yourself and just ask as well. Oh. Sorry, so sorry. I guess um, it's probably a separate aside, but I'm lucky enough that my kids have maintained the food allergy, but also have the asthma and allergic mm -hmm. rhinitis. So I guess that can all still be maintained. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like your food allergy doesn't disappear. You can definitely mm. have, and have the asthma and the allergic rhinitis. Um, but you know, the what allergies do you <laughs> of that your child has? Uh, my boys, so egg, dairy. Well, one's egg only, and the other is egg, dairy, sesame, and peanut. Yeah, so it's interesting looking at that chart if you've reintroduced you get the asthma allergic rhinitis but I was just thinking oh what does that mean for yeah my boys so what that could mean is that they have those IgE like diagnosed allergies but do they also have a non-IgE allergy as well that you haven't identified yeah okay yes yeah right and did you mention dust mites yes dust mites yeah, yeah. um and that is um I mean that's largely probably what's triggering the yeah you can't eliminate mm. i have a whole ebook on dust mites and um, you like you can't eliminate them mm. so you, and, and then at school like i had a client recently mm. asthma went to a storeroom in school and yeah. had such a big reaction i think they had to call an ambulance wow um, so yeah you know, you can easily eliminate egg from your child's life. It's not very yes. eliminate dust mites from your child's life. Mm, yeah. I am. Um, so my son has a dust mite allergy and that's the one that I would definitely say has got worse over time. Not mm. So now we're, we've got the whole, whole gambit of dust mite covers. Like yes. Carpets, but I vacuum with a good Dyson, like multiple mm -hmm. times. I'm probably going to get an air purifier. Um, yeah, I've wondered about air purifiers, but yeah. yeah. For dust mites, I think they're they're a great idea. Yeah. yeah, okay. Thanks. No worries. And then someone has asked, 18 month old diagnosed with mild egg allergy, and we've been told to start the latter with muffins, no red rash. Could this con be contributing to congestion? Absolutely. 
So cut them out again, see what happens. It's easy to test, cut out muffins. If the congestion goes, then yeah, it was too soon to be on that ladder. And I understand why people are so keen to get you on these ladders is because they want to desensitize you because there is a lot of research to say, you know, you can do desensitization and, you know, that's the path that they're going with. But I know that with my daughter, because she had the anaphylaxis, there was no way on this earth that I was going to give her egg in any shape or form, not in a hospital setting. So she had zero eggs in her life for about four years. Like we didn't even have the eggs in the house. So she was never exposed to any egg and she still outgrew it at a very reasonable time. So I don't think you need to have that low level exposure to outgrow your allergy. And funnily enough, my kids never had eczema. So again, they didn't fit that normal pattern. Bobby, um, you need to bathe and look at Sorry, I got distracted from my tonsils. So not many people will correlate big tonsils with allergies. And, you know, it really rang an alarm bell for me one time when I was talking to a GP and they, the GP said that he'd taken his child to an ENT. And in that meeting, he realized that that was just a consent meeting to get the tonsils removed. So that was not a meeting to discuss why the tonsils were enlarged, why, you know, whatever. It was just, it was literally meet and greet, sign the papers to get the tonsils out. And that's not good enough. Really, it's, you know, an ENT will really like to take out tonsils because that's what he's good at and that's what he's been trained to do. So if you go to an ENT, that is kind of the path that you're on. But it's really important to look at why your tonsils are big while your child's tonsils are big. So IgE, this is the, remember the immediate reaction, E for emergency. And in this study, 70% of the kids with big tonsils had, were sensitized to more than one allergen. And 30% um, uh, had no IgE positivity. So there's these results confirm that allergic response may be a, fa a risk factor for big tonsils um, because of local inflammation. So never, ever, ever consent to getting your child's tonsils out without doing some sort of food work and ideally an elimination, a reintroduction, because that is the best way. And then this is a question I get asked a lot. Oh, my, my kids' tonsils grew back, which is such a weird thing. And this is, again, in the research, in conclusion, allergic disease is associated with the tonsils growing back after having them removed. So if you've got the tonsils out and then they come back, it's because the underlying cause of there being an allergy hadn't been addressed in the first place. Oh my gosh, I've never had such troubles with this mouse. And then to compound things as if it wasn't bad enough, removing the tonsils can actually increase the allergies. So in this study of 1.2 million children, that many, so 12,000 had their tonsils out, 31,000 had their um, both adenoids and tonsils out. And um, they were associated with increased long-term risks of respiratory infectious and allergic diseases. So our results suggest that it's important to consider the long-term risks when making decisions to take out your tonsils or your adenoids. So again, if you're on the path of getting your tonsils out, look at allergies first. So somebody put in a question in advance, which is a great question. And it is, okay, so how do you know if the tonsils are big because of allergies or big because they're infected? And this summarizes it and this is from the american family physician so just a normal like doctor's information page so hypertrophic tonsils so big tonsils no signs of infection if it's tonsillitis then you're going to have fever throat pain pain with swallowing like exudate so pus um you know infectious mono which is glandular fever you've got you know the fever the sore throat so if you've got just big tonsils, there's no fever, there's no sore throat, there's no pus, they're just big tonsils. And that's when you think about food allergies. If it is infectious, and I 
I had to share this. It's not really related to allergies, but I just loved it so much. So if the tonsils are big because they keep getting infected, then you can use something called NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which we use in clinic all the time, but vinegar, my goodness. So date vinegar, which we can't really get, apple cider vinegar and grape vinegar all will kill off the strep, which is causing the recurrent tonsillitis. So again, much better than getting your tonsils out, just gargle with vinegar. And it's something about brushing it with a, a brush as well. Awesome. So then the next one is the recurrent ear infections and glue ear. So the ear, the middle ear, the inner ear are immunologically responsive. And that means that if you have a food sensitivity, that will be reflected in your ears. Somebody explained this to me one time, it's to embryology and the way our body is formed that you know, kind of gut tissue ends up in our ears or something like that. But there is a link between having glue ear and food allergies and nasal polyps as well. So if you're on a steroid spray daily for nasal polyps, maybe it's food. Um, and again, so allergy, if you've got an allergy, you've got between a two and four and a half fold increased incidence of otitis media with effusion, which is glue ear. And 80% of people with otitis media with effusion, it's because of allergy. And if you've got glue ear, then your child's walking around with this soupy stuff at body temperature, just waiting to get infected. So the problem is not just that they can't hear and everything is a bit muffled. It's that it's primed and ready to get infected, which is why kids get grommets put in because it drains away this fluid. But actually, instead of getting grommets, you could just find out what the allergies are. And then adenoids, same thing, but dust mites and mold are particularly implicated in adenoids. And funnily enough, I didn't even realize this, that your adenoids actually disappear when you're after six. Obviously, if they're massive and your child has obstructive sleep apnea, you can't wait until they're six <laughs> to address it. But if it's a food allergy and you can remove it, then after the age of six, the, the adenoids aren't a problem anymore. So I'll just pause there. Any questions on tonsils, adenoids, ear infections? Nope. Okay. Um, and funnily enough, yes, my kids never had any of those issues either, I guess, because they had the IgE allergies, which were identified and removed. They didn't have any of the, the non-IgE allergies that are harder to identify. So dust mites, beautiful little things. So you don't, start off with a dust mite allergy, but you can get it over time and you can check on a blood test. You don't need to go to an immunologist. You can just go to your doctor and say, I want to get an IgE blood test for dust mites. There's two different types. There's like a Australian one, an American one or something. I don't know, maybe that's cockroaches, but there's two types of, of dust mites and you need to test for both. And if your child has a dust mite allergy, then it sucks because you need to minimize clutter. You need to clean their room like weekly, wipe down all the surfaces. Something that I realized with my son recently was that he had bunk beds. I thought I'm vacuuming twice a week, yet I don't change the top bunk because nobody sleeps in it. So it's just accumulating dust. And I was like, oh, duh. Um, careful selection of bedding so you can get the dust mite covers. If you just go really, really good quality, like you know a thousand thread count or whatever, that is apparently just as good as the actual dust mite covers, as is eucalyptus bedding. Um, and you have to wash all the sheets, all the toys every week. And I like to put them in the tumble dryer. So I like to dry them on the line in the sun first and then put them in the tumble dryer. And the other thing I really like to do is I use the same set constantly. So I take it off the bed, I wash it, I dry it, tumble dry it, put it back on the bed. So it never goes into the cupboard. Because I used to find that was a massive trigger for my son. If I took a doona cover out of the cupboard, obviously it's been sitting there for weeks, months, whatever, and it's got dust on it now. 
And then you put it on the bed and he would start to rub his eyes instantly. So it's boring because you end up using the same dinner cover over and over again, but he doesn't care. HEPA vacuum. I recently upgraded my Dyson to the latest and greatest Dyson. And it's frankly terrifying how much dust comes out every single time I use it. It's amazing. I keep thinking, you know, surely I've got all the dust now, but no, every time it's full. Controlling the humidity. So, you know, dust and mold kind of go together. So if you know you're a bit high moisture in your house, you might want to get a dehumidifier to bring that down. Nasal irrigation. So that's one of those neti pots or, you know, squeezy things. Obviously, kids are not huge fans of putting that up their nose. But what they are a huge fan of is going to the beach. So making sure you get your child into the ocean and getting dumped by waves as much as possible is the best way to get the irrigation going. And then the air purifier is definitely a good thing. So as I say, it's really, really hard to eliminate dust mites from your child's lives, but there are lots of things that you can put in place to try. So what do we do about all these things? This is, um, you know, we work on repairing gut wall, reducing inflammation, supporting digestion, supporting immunity, optimizing the microbiome and avoiding the allergen. So that's basically what we do. And I'm gonna talk in some subsequent slides a lot more about this one, the optimizing the microbiome. Um, I'll just say, that, so that's what I've done with my son. And he was allergic to all of these foods, even like chickpeas, green peas, like who's ever heard of anyone being allergic to these foods before? It was crazy. Um, and now he's still got four tree nut allergies, but he has grown out of a lot of his tree nut allergies. So um, somebody just asked a specific air purifier. Yes, the, the brand that's most reputable is called Innovair. So I-N-N-O-V-A-I-R. And they're about a grand for the cheapest one. Um, and then a question, is a skin prick test or a reliable way to check for dust mite allergy? Yes, it is. But going to visit an allergy doctor can have a long waiting list and be very expensive. So I'm a fan of getting it checked just in a blood test from the GP as the first port of call. Um, whoops. So I'm sure my son will love me sharing his stool tests in years to come. But um, this was a stool test I did for him maybe four years ago. And you would think a naturopath son would have no issues on a stool test, but you'd be absolutely wrong. So these things here, the bacteroidetes and the formicutes, both low. So these are the two big families of good gut bacteria. So you don't want these to be low. You want to have lots and lots of good gut bacteria. Um, and he was low, like not crazy low, but but below the reference range for both. So he needed more fiber. He needed more prebiotics, he needed more legumes, which is funny because he wasn't eating any legumes or any nuts. So legumes and nuts are great prebiotic foods and he wasn't eating any because he was allergic to them. So it does kind of make sense from that point of view, but it also shows that that was holding him back. So it's a good reason to, you never exclude foods from your child's diet unless you have to. Um, but what was more alarming was he had this bacteria called Citrobacter. And it's this is kind of a few different types of Citrobacter. And you can see the normal range was five by 10 to the six, and he was one by 10 to the nine, which means he had a thousand times too many, not just a bit too many, but he had a thousand times too many. So, and I've seen that come up with other allergy kids as well. Don't really know why. And then he also had even though these are not above the reference range, Prevotel and Fusobacterium, they're still kind of, especially Fusobacterium, you don't want it. So what did I do? I gave him prebiotics in supplemental form, as well as the foods. And I gave him a herbal blend, the reduced Citrobacter. And luckily, because he is a natural son, he loves taking his herbs. 
So that was no problem. And I've just sent off a new sample yesterday um, to see where he's at now with all of this stuff. Um, so another question, is there any link between allergies and iron deficiency? Not that I've ever heard of, no. A three-year-old with large tonsils ad noise glue ear. We don't know if she has any allergies and haven't started down the path. She also has iron deficiency and that improved with supplements. It completely dropped down. So yeah, if if you take the supplements and your iron deficiency gets better and then it gets bad again, it can be a number of things. Um, but you definitely need to check out what's going on in her gut and what other foods that she could be eating that are impairing her ability to absorb that. But so allergies and iron deficiency, not really, but celiac disease and iron deficiency, like yes, it can cause it. Um, should legumes be prepped in a specific way? Absolutely. So you need to soak legumes for a period of time, depending on the size of them. Thing, big things like kidney beans, black beans, I like to soak them for 24 hours. Maybe change the water a couple of times if it gets a bit stinky then rinse them with lots and lots of fresh water. And then if you want to increase legumes in your diet, buy an instant pot or a pressure cooker because it makes cooking them a piece of cake. It's like 40 minutes instead of three or four hours. That's how to make them most digestible. Boiled, so that is boiling them, but in a quicker way. Can's not so good. You've got the lining of the can, which you know has a lot of chemicals in it, but also it can be much more difficult to tolerate them. Um, so my daughter has dust mite allergies. You've got the dust mite covers, you've changed the sheets, no carpet. You've got the air purifier. And she still blows her nose every night and morning. Should you be checking for food allergies as well? You definitely could, but I would be looking at what's going on in the microbiome. And I use a probiotic with kids that reduces your sensitivity to environmental allergens. So taking some probiotics, um, but also, I mean, as I, I had to like cull what I put in this, but some kids actually have bacteria in their gut that produce histamine. So even if you're doing your utmost best to remove things like dust mites from their life, they're still reacting because they've got a little bacteria in their gut that's pumping out histamine, even if there's no dust mites. And you can also have a genetic snip or two so a genetic sort of variation that means you don't break down histamine. So again, same thing, even when you're doing your absolute best. And the thing with not having carpets, I mean, everybody rips out their carpets when their child has a dust mite allergy, but wooden floors can be worse because the dust just floats around, at least in carpets, it's kind of embedded in the carpet and then you vacuum it up, but it's not all around. So you might be better you can at least mop it like more frequently, but yet yeah, I wouldn't go ripping out carpets because of dust mite allergies. Um, I think she's over after mass, mass cells and double MTHFR. So if you've done the MTHFR test, you may have looked at the other SNPs. There's one called DAO and one called HMNT. So you can have a look at those and see what's going on. Um, and it's also a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you've got a dust mite allergy, you'll mouth breathe because you've got the inflammation in your nose. Mouth breathing increases your histamine. It's just, <laughs> it just goes on and on. There's so many layers to this, but you could actually be exacerbating your histamine issues. Oh, no mouth breathing. Well, then, good. <laughs> it's at least one thing not to worry about. Um, so yes, this is just other allergy children. So you can see this one had Morganella which is the one that produces histamine. So of course he was having lots of reactions plus the citrobacter. And this child had lots of citrobacter plus Klebsiella, which is I think also a histamine producer. Um, and yeah, this is just in the research that citrobacter will aggravate the allergic symptoms by causing inflammation. So probiotics, everybody wants to know what's the probiotic I need to take. But it really depends, you know, um, this one, lactobacillus salivarius LS01 is good for eczema. Um, this one is good for immune control. Like they're all 
different things. So it really depends on what else is going on for your child. Ultimately, to improve your gut health, you need more of the left-hand side, more dirt, more fruit and vegetables, more fish, more fermented foods, and less of the processed meats, less of the lollies, less of the screens, and less of the soft drinks. And the reason for the screens is because if your child's on the screen, they're not digging in the dirt. So take away the screen and send them outside to dig in the dirt. Cool. I went through that at the end because um, I could I didn't realize what late it was. So now we've got 10 minutes for more questions. So whatever you want to know, preferably about allergies, but you can go broader than that if you want to, just ask them. So testing, I kind of glossed over testing a bit in terms of what we test for allergies, but so you can do the blood test with your GP and you can do five IgE allergies every year under Medicare. So I usually send people for the environmental one. So dust mite times two, um, mold, cat, dog, if you have them. Um, to me, it's kind of pointless getting an IgE food blood test done at the doctors because you will know if it's a straight IgE allergy, you'll know because you'll give it to your child and have immediate reaction. Then the IgG test we do a blood test, which is around $200, but only checks for 44 foods. It doesn't check for everything, but some people find that really, really helpful. And sometimes it's like, oh, actually it's not the gluten, it's not the dairy, it's the egg. So it can be quite helpful. Um, and that's the main tests that we do. Is there something that we can use in place of fermented foods that has similar benefits? Absolutely. So fermented foods are great, but really, it is actually more important to go with prebiotic foods. So prebiotic foods are garlic and onion. So I don't know if it's an Irish thing, but we put garlic, well, not so much garlic, but we put onion into everything. So that's really good. Um, legumes are your biggest bang for buck when it comes to prebiotics. So lentils, beans, um, anything like that. Um, and then like there's some really high prebiotic foods, but we don't really eat them much like chicory and Jerusalem artichoke. But basically eat a really diverse range of fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds. Make that the bulk of your child's diet and that's going to be the most efficient way to improve their gut. What's the name of the main test that tests for all food allergens? So you mean the Ig G test that I organize or to do for IgE, you go to, uh, so it's an IgG and I use a company called ImmuPro and it gets sent to Germany. So that's the one that I've always used. I found it to be very reliable and reasonably inexpensive. Sometimes when you do it, if your child, if everything comes up, red it really just means that your child's got a leaky gut it's not really that they're allergic to that food it's just that their gut is letting through everything three-year-old has been having constipation since she started solids we've removed dairy and gluten for a few months and have used almond since should i change the almond milk to oat milk so oat milk will contain gluten so if you want to be gluten-free you can't have oat milk 80 percent of constipation in kids will improve by cutting out dairy but obviously that still leaves 20 percent that won't so if you've done the dietary changes and you haven't seen an improvement then it can be a dysbiosis issue it can be something you should do a gut test for and um, they can have an overgrowth of methanogens that causes constipation they can have h pylori that's lowered their stomach acid like there can be lots of other things so if it hasn't budged by removing dairy then yeah you might want to make an appointment and i see with breastfeeding mothers in particular that they'll cut out everything to try and resolve their child's gut issues and then they're nutrient deficient themselves and there's even a link between mother's anxiety about food and the rate of kids food allergies so there's even suggestion that by reducing the food the mother's eating is actually perpetuating food allergies. 
Um, what's your thoughts on food protein leaking through the gut into the bloodstream causing an allergic reaction? And is meat stock or bone broth a good way to decrease this? So yes, if you've got high intestinal permeability, a leaky gut, then yes, the food proteins will get through. And that's where kind of the IgG reactions come from. I'm a huge fan of testing, not guessing with all of these things. So you can you can measure the leakiness of the gut on a poo test, but the best way is in a urine test. It just depends on the age of the child, how easy that's going to be to manage because they need to drink a little solution, which tastes okay. But then every wee for the next six hours needs to be collected. Um, so it's a bit funny, but that will tell you how leaky your child's gut is. And if it's not leaky, well, then you know you don't need to worry about that. And then if it is leaky, yes, meat stock will help, but it's much better to take concentrated forms of the of the gut building nutrients. Um, it's just going to get to a much much quicker result than drinking like three cups of meat stock every day. Um, which team member to book for daughter's constipation? Summer. Summer is our eczema and constipation queen. This is what she deals with from like very small infants all the way up. So if your child has constipation or eczema, book with Summer. So we're nearly at the hour. Does anyone have any final questions? No, well, it's bedtime for me then. No problem, you're welcome. Thank you. Oh, which team member for tonsils, adenoids, glue ear and iron deficiency? So um, Kelly has done a lot of the tonsils work recently, um, but really anyone in the team, those are kind of bread and butter, excuse the pun, but kind of bread and butter things that we deal with all the time. So anyone. Um, Yes, thank you all for turning up live. I know you can watch it in a recording, but it's much nicer for me to actually get some um, questions as I go along. Because I'm not a nighttime person. <laughs> so it's hard for me to focus without questions. Beautiful. All right, well, I will end this. And yeah, just, oh, hang on. Yeah. And if you think of any questions later, I'm sure most of you are on Facebook and Instagram. Hopefully you follow me there and you can just shoot me a message. Otherwise, good night and thank you. You can watch it in a recording, but it's much nicer for me to actually get some um, questions as I go along. Because I'm not a nighttime person. <laughs> so it's hard for me to focus without questions. Beautiful. All right, well, I will end this and yeah, just, oh, hang on. Yeah. And if you think of any questions later, I'm sure most of you are on Facebook and Instagram. Hopefully you follow me there and you can just shoot me a message. Otherwise, good night and thank you.